today on the Perception in Action podcast. My interview with Casey Kreider, head volleyball coach at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, discussing his journey from information processing to an ecological approach to coaching volleyball. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25 year journey as a researcher, professor, and high performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about my new book, Learning to Optimize Movement. Harnessing the Power of the Athlete-Environment Relationship, available now on Amazon in paperback and ebook formats. This book is the follow-up to my best-selling skill acquisition book, How We Learn to Move. In it, I discuss how we can go beyond learning basic coordination to becoming an elite mover, evidence-based principles for learning and coaching optimal movement. Take your game from proficiency to mastery. Now on to the show. All right. Today, my guest is Casey Kreider, uh, who's been on the podcast before in some journal clubs, but I wanted to have him on to kind of talk a lot specifically about his journey as a coach and and using some uh, the ecological approach and kind of his experiences. So thanks for joining me, Casey. Rob, it's always a pleasure. Well, some of my favorite uh, moments professionally have been uh, involving you, uh, both indirectly and directly. So I always love these. So thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, thank you, Casey. Uh, so start off with, can you tell us uh, your, your background, set, set the stage for, um, you, uh, where you, where you started? Yeah, I was, a really bad middle school basketball player. Um, and I pretty quickly realized I wasn't going to Duke or, you know, the Sacramento Kings or whoever it was. And, <laughs> Uh, my dad tricked me into trying volleyball, maybe end of my freshman year and uh, kind of heading into my sophomore year in high school. And uh, I'm not somebody who's ever really, since I was a kid, I never really appreciated the idea of balance much. <laughs> so I I kind of, I liked volleyball pretty quickly and then I loved volleyball and I've loved it since. And that's really shaped um got my life up to this point, um, 33. And so well over half my life has been invested in this game. And I think almost immediately, uh, maybe even prior, I, I knew that, um, I wanted to coach and, uh, coaching was something that I thought was a cool way <laughs> to avoid <laughs> talk. Yeah, as a 15, 16 year old kid, I was going, I don't want to do anything that is like, you know, real life. I, want to <laughs> I, like, I like, I like sports. So I, uh, I did that and, uh, I kind of made that decision early on and I developed pretty quickly as a player, had the opportunity to play in college at Pepperdine for a, a world renowned coach who actually uh, had a PhD in exercise science and, um, was fortunate enough to be introduced to some of the more academic stuff, uh, as it applies to, to coaching and pedagogy and stuff like that. And I was ready to coach right after I graduated. A nice career, uh, had the opportunity to win some awards and play in some cool matches. And and uh, I was ready to be done. I was ready to go. Hey, I had coaching and never left. I had coached when I was in college, and um, and uh, my my coach said, "Hey, you should play professionally." You know, and I said, "Okay." You know, he could have told me to go rob a bank, and I'd be like, "No, just <laughs> give me an address," because <laughs> I I just thought so highly of him and. So I went and played professionally for a year in Europe and just had a blast. What a cool experience it is to play a game for money and not have to go to class uh, when you when you do it. <laughs> and so uh, I did that for a year, had a couple other opportunities, and I just kept feeling this pull back to coaching that I had felt for years. You know, I just wanted to be in that space and that role. And so I I ended up cutting my career a little bit short. Um, after having a really successful season as a team and individually. And then I went back to Pepperdine and coached for a season Stanford for two seasons after making the switch from coaching the men at Pepperdine to the women at Stanford, seven seasons after those two at Stanford at seven seasons at Miami. And now I just, I think 
Maybe 53 weeks here. <laughs> uh, UMBC is the head coach. My first opportunity to be uh, in that role with that title. So and now I'm here at 33, looking like I'm 63. And, <laughs> uh, and way. I wouldn't agree, Casey. But oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about kind of you, how you learned, I guess, both to play and to coach. And one of the things we just talked about this before we started recording, you know, I've, one of the things that really interesting things I've discovered from getting into volleyball and stuff is volleyball has been into motor learning science and theory for a long, long time, uh, way deeper than a lot of other sports. And so I think it's really helped to, to grow it. So can you talk a little bit about kind of your, how you learned to coach and, and, and some of that? Um, before we get into the kind of different views. Yeah. 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 I think you touched on something there. Um, our sport, um, at least in our country, but really, I think across the globe. And it's, I, I don't think people realize how popular it's sport, our sport is globally. It's the second most participated in sport in the world, obviously, behind soccer, mm -hmm. football, whatever we're calling it on this podcast. <laughs> um, but really, we owe it an enormous debt of gratitude to a couple of people. Um, probably chief among them, a guy named Dr. Carl McGowan. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a motor learning professor and a volleyball coach and researcher. And one of his colleagues and one of the people that he mentored early on was the guy that I played for at Pepperdine, who's often considered maybe the best volleyball coach in the history of the sport across the planet. Uh, but if not, somewhere in the top two or three or five or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think he's clearly the best, but obviously the bias there. <laughs> His name is Marv Dunphy. He also got a PhD in uh, exercise science, very familiar with the motor behavior literature of the time, which at the time it was, uh, I think we're talking the, the early 80s. So Schmidt was, what, 75 with Schemath, mm -hmm. and it blew up in the late 70s, and he was king of the 80s. And and uh, so there was they were both very familiar with um, – Schmidt's work and a lot of the corollary work uh, stuff in contextual interference and the fits and Posner stuff. And, and, but that stuff uh, has been in our game um, for decades in ways that it, other sports are just maybe kind of coming across it and realizing the value of, of applying some rigor to your methods. Um, and so I came up as a coach, uh, well, as a player, I came up through that lens, uh, which was really special. And on top of that, I, I happened to play for a person in college who both through his academic experiences, his life experiences, and just his character um, had an intuitive, uh, I think an intuitive sense for a lot of the stuff that we now know about motivation, about psychological safety, things like that. He was, Man, he's he's the king. He should be president or, you know, galactic emperor or whatever it is. And he's pretty special. Uh, Marv was or is still around, <laughs> still up on the hill in Malibu. Um, and uh, so I kind of I kind of learned, um, I think, initially, without realizing it, um, a lot of, of my, the coaching beliefs that I initially held through him kind of as a player, I really always was interested in how practice was designed and feedback. And I just liked that stuff, you know, and I always was hanging around when they would run summer camps and I would hang around when they do coaching clinics. I just liked it. And I was into coaching, you know? And uh, so I learned, um, and then I took a course that he taught because he was a professor at Pepperdine. I took a course that he taught um, foundations of coaching in the first three or two or three weeks were about motor behavior and motor learning. Um, through a pretty, as you'd imagine, pretty information processing lens, uh, we learned a lot about textual interference, Fitz and Posner's three-stage model, and um, all sorts of memory-based concepts and uh, stuff that was popular, uh, I think, maybe at the time that I was learning, but certainly had a pretty rich history in uh, our sport. And so I had this really kind of, uh, I don't know if I'd call it an unfair advantage. I earned it. You know, I was there, mm -hmm. but it was an unfair advantage to start my coaching career in that I started from a place of people expecting the methodology to be rigorous, mm -hmm. not based on how they did it, not based on what they felt, but like they, they, the, what Carl was incredible about what Marv was incredible about among dozens of other things, but they 
they appreciated and deeply understood these concepts and then expressed them in the ways they coach. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think a lot of people get that opportunity at the start. Oftentimes they, they cross paths with it when they're a little bit more fully formed as a coach. And that, that there's some advantages to that, but it's also some challenges. I'm a coach and I hold some beliefs. I oh, my, my watch is going off. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if I'm a coach and I hold some beliefs, maybe I have a couple of years or whatever of success, seasons of success, it becomes harder and harder for me to let go of maybe uh, or, or to be challenged in some of my biases. And that's what all of our opinions are. They're just biases. And that's, that's great. But um, I didn't come run across that at all. I started from a place of people going, Hey, here's what the academic literature is saying about skill development, skill acquisition, motor learning, motor control. Here's what you're, and that's where I started. So before I even coached a team outside of, you know, I would, you know, do camps and stuff like that. But before I even really dug into making coaching my profession, I hit, I was already engaging with that stuff poorly. I'll, I'll really <laughs> I didn't understand what I was doing, but I was, I was exposed to it and I was inspired by it. And I'm sitting right here. I'm looking at Schmidt and Lee's motor learning and performance in ninth or 12th or hundredth. Mm, I got one back up there. So we're doing, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. And uh, I would go through that thing. I wouldn't understand any of it. And I'd pretend like I knew, and then I'd start over and, mm -hmm. uh, so that, uh, that's kind of how I got started in coaching. And then I, when I coached with Marv, um, I, you know, got some really good stuff, making it my profession. Now, I, now there was a weight to it, right? It wasn't just like going to a summer camp and tricking little Johnny into, you know, serving the ball over the net. It was, this mattered. I had to be good at it so I could <laughs> <laughs> not do my car, you know? And, um, so I, uh, uh, yeah, when I when I worked at Pepperdine for a season, I just you know, soaked up a lot and um, and uh, kind of set off on this path of like, hey, I'm going to coach through a scientific lens. I'm going to coach through um, the use of some academic rigor. And um, it just it became a hobby in addition to being my profession, in addition to being um, something that was important to me. It also became like a hobby. And so now we weird guy who maybe I don't watch as much Netflix as I do like read academic journal articles. <laughs> I like it. And it, it, there's times when I've come across an article, I get, you know, man, uh, turvy stuff is, is tough. So I, I get a page or two and I'm like, I'm good. I'm going to go watch Netflix, <laughs> you know, but I, I really like the, the academic stuff. I really do. It's just, it's just interesting to me. And I never have uh, any trouble like picking the book up or picking the article up and, and working through it because I just enjoy it. So uh, and then obviously through that enjoyment, through that hobby, and we can get into this a little later, but I, I ended up crossing paths with some stuff that very much uh, challenged a lot of stuff that I had come across as I was coming up at the beginning. So, um, but yeah, our sport to, to kind of tie it all together, our sport um, is for lack of a better term, incredibly fortunate and blessed uh, to have those two people. In addition to some other ones, there's a guy named John Kessel, who's been big in that Doug Beal. Uh, there's a number of people who really, appreciated the value of some academic rigor uh, in mm -hmm. the method and coaching in ways that I don't know other sports well enough, but I, from the outside, it doesn't seem like other sports maybe have in the same way. Yeah. And uh, at least, at least at the time, you know, we're talking back in the eighties and nineties and certainly you know, today, 50 years or so. And yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a, a that's kind of my my background, at least in the start of my coaching career. Certainly, there's been a huge evolution. As you <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, I, I think you know. I think that that's a great point, Casey. I think yeah, for sure. I think you it overcomes some huge hurdles. I find you know the you know accepting that there's a science to skill in motor learning, <laughs> um, and that it it can contribute to your coaching are big hurdles, right? No matter what approach you use within that, right? There are big hurdles to overcome. You know, have, listening to outsiders who haven't played volleyball, right? That, to your sport, that, that those are big hurdles to overcome, and uh, you, you know, I think it's a great. Uh, you know, advantage. <laughs> yeah. Someone break those down. Um, you know, um, you mentioned you kind of, they have a, so what was kind of the, the ecological, was there one kind of, uh, that kind of some of the questioning, some of the, the, the theory that you'd be learning, was there one thing that kind of triggered it for you or is kind of a slow build? 
Uh, yeah, both. <laughs> uh, it's still so, going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's an important piece of that. Yeah. But, uh, I think uh, we weren't. I, let me put it this way. I the the deeper I got into some of this stuff, I didn't. There's two things. I didn't feel like I was having uh, an impact on the athletes' development and on their performance that was, I don't know, commiserate, maybe, is that, if that's the right word, uh, with with what uh, I expected. Like, I, I, I don't think that, that they were developing and performing as well as I hoped they would and preferred they would and was working really hard to, to help them do. And um, so there was some insecurity, obviously, very quickly, if you, if you're, you know, you have any sort of, I don't know, uh, self uh, awareness, then at some point you stop blaming them for not performing well. And you appreciate that, hey, maybe they're not being given the best developmental opportunities mm-hmm. and well that's kind of my job <laughs> <laughs> and so um what i did initially was i i just had this really stubborn habit of like i'm going to go back to the science go into the science science will because I, I i had this 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 misconception that science was like a fact-finding mission mm-hmm. that the scientific process was going to produce truths that were inarguable and as i have long since learned that it's that's just not really how science operates it what it's more hey we're gonna we're gonna maybe discover some evidence we're gonna think deeply about the evidence we're gonna theorize some stuff we're gonna test those theories and those theories will evolve and adapt and change and and really they're the facts aren't the most important thing like mm-hmm. the, the facts that come out of come out of science are, are it's it's more this process of like trying to understand and using evidence to support our understanding so um, I started thinking that if I go to the science, I'll find the facts and then I can go, ha, you don't know. I know because I know the science and the science says, and so therefore I am right and you are wrong and I'm better and you are worse. <laughs> and uh, so I just went back to Schmidt's book and marked it up more and asked more questions of other coaches. And uh, I went on Google Scholar. And I typed in schema theory in as many different languages that I could could think of. And um, I think at one point, well, one of the things that I found frustrating was that a lot of uh, times when I did ask coaches about, hey, I'm I'm trying to subscribe to this, mm-hmm. the science, you know, I, I'm doing everything I can. I'm being as faithful as I can to the science. And it's not working in the way that maybe it's working for you. When I observe your team, oh, wow, they were bad and they got good and, and my team is good and it gets a little bit better. And and uh or maybe it's supposed to work like we say that hey this is the best way it should work better than this it's not working and the response i was often getting from coaches who weren't academic not that they were familiar with that the academics stuff, but they weren't academics you know is well you're just not doing the science well enough. <laughs> it's not hard enough you know and uh and that was tough you know you you kind of it's all that's a hard thing to hear because you're trying so hard and you you look up these people you revere them and they care about you and you care about them and you want to do it right. And, and to hear that, like, you're just not good at it. It's, it sucks. <laughs> and uh, so there's like this panic and this frustration. And eventually, um, I'm just like getting more and more frustrated. And I, I'm i like almost daily going on Google. And I remember at one point I'm on like the 11th or 12th or 36th page of a Google Scholar search on, I think it was schema theory. And I came across um, uh, an article that like ruined my life for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, God, who was it? Um, Digby Elliott, Greg Anson, and, and Keith Davids right. in five published an article that was something along the lines of like, I don't know if it was constraints, uh, information processing or constraints based approaches. Divergent or complementary, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, exactly. What That's almost it exactly it. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. There you go. Sorry. I can't <laughs> remember. It, it really, <laughs> there's some scars here from this article. So I went through and I'm kind of, kind of tracking maybe a little bit of, I don't know what one of the two is saying, Anson or Elliot. One of them's talking about some, you know, pretty information processing, cognitive based stuff. And I go, I, uh, a little over my head, but I, I think I get it. And then one's starting to talk about like the, 
the brain. I'm not a neuro. I never got into neuroscience. That whole, it's just a lot. Like it's intimidating for somebody mm-hmm. who doesn't have their PhD yet someday, maybe, but, uh, <laughs> and then all of a sudden this lunatic starts rambling on about, uh, Hey, what if we conceptualize it a little different? What if, uh, it wasn't necessarily, what if it was more about things like direct perception? What if it was, uh, a little bit more about specifying information? What if it wasn't about so much about like what we told them, but the environment that they're in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I was not happy. I was not happy with this. I thought, hey, man, who allowed this guy, this <laughs> David's whack job, to get a degree and a published material? So I did what any reasonable 26-year-old volleyball coach does. And I emailed him and I said, I think you're wrong. <laughs> and, uh, I don't think it was that extreme, but it was basically like, hey, I don't understand what you're getting at here. I like to think that I'm relatively well-read and I've never come across this. What's going on? <laughs> and, uh, you know, Keith obviously he was nice yeah the best yeah. He was awesome. he's got like the coolest manner mm-hmm. for being somebody who uh has has put some stuff out there that that is uh challenging to convention um i would have expected more along the lines of you know maybe shulhorn who was like yeah you're gonna like we're gonna debate this right we're gonna we're gonna get after this and uh keith was like yeah no i that's how i came up in the same way i know that stuff and um and then he goes, do you know who Carl Newell is? And I go, no. And he goes, I'd be worth looking into. And um, and uh, he goes, you know who James Gibson is? And I go, no. <laughs> <laughs> and here's where I kind of landed. And so I chewed on some stuff. Didn't make any sense. Went back to Keith. Go, I still don't get it. And I kept going back to Keith and kept going back to Keith. And he just was so patient and so kind. And it really helped me appreciate the value of of understanding the academic work through the voice of the academics that makes any sense mm-hmm. and uh i i started to re reshape my my idea around this it was my job to translate these concepts into my sport not my job to pick apart the concepts i wasn't really qualified 26 years old i'm not i don't really have the right, in my opinion, to pick apart direct perception. I'm mm-hmm. not qualified yet. I'd like to get to some point, but I'm not yet. So, so I, I started to, I, I that's kind of how I got connected to you. I just fell in love with your podcast. And then I think I wrote you an email and saying, I, I need help. And you said, okay. You know? <laughs> and, uh, there was, there's a whole bunch of people, Tom Perry, who's at IU Kokomo, and he helped a lot at the beginning. And um, I just started digging in. Ed Cullen is like the coolest person on earth. Mm-hmm. He's so special. And he helped me a lot. And I just started digging in and uh, went through a really destabilizing period where I didn't like myself as a coach. There was some guilt. There was so much doubt. Um, and that was tough for me because my identity is very much rooted in coaching. Like I talked about before, I don't balance isn't really my thing. So like my identity is as much coaching as it probably could be, at least at this point in my life. And certainly at that point in my life. So here you're go- going through this process of, Hey, you're just not any good at the thing you care most about the thing you want to be good at. That's I didn't, nobody handles that great. At least nobody I know of. I certainly didn't. Um, and I grunt, but I, you know what? The one thing I did, I was, I was brave. And I know that sounds like a weird word, but I, I hung in there mm-hmm. hung in there and I kept chipping away and I kept asking questions and I kept losing sleep and I kept, uh, being frustrated until I started. And it was never like you said earlier, it wasn't a moment where I go, ah, oh, this is how I want to be. This is the way that I want to do it. Um, but I chipped away and there was these little moments, little steps where it's like, okay, I, I think I get it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And a little bit of it was performance-based. A lot of it was developmental-based with our athletes. And um, what it came down to is when I got kind of, not nowhere close to the end, but when I got to this point where I just felt congruent for the first time in my coaching career. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not equipped or, or probably qualified to say this is the way mm-hmm. somebody else can do that. Somebody smarter than me or more successful than me. What I can say is this is the way for me. Mm-hmm. If it's any sense. I can say that when I go to sleep at night, I sleep pretty soundly because I like what, uh, I, the, the, the ecological stuff, um, speaks to, to the, my beliefs, my values. Mm-hmm. 
And the one thing I do want to say, if you'll give me for sure, more, yeah, cool case. Rambling. Um, I do think uh, a lot of the ecological stuff um, suffers uh, from an unnecessary uh, attachment of like moral superiority. Like, hey, you're a better person because you could. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And the thing that bugs me the most, a lot of it bugs me when you hear people go, well, you don't care about kids if you don't. That's asinine, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I I was incredibly cared about and I was instructed. Mm -hmm. I had illustrations of optimal models that I was expected to try to pursue. And and I had a wonderful experience. I had a lot of success. I'm happy as a clam. I wouldn't change anything about how I was how I was trained. Uh, the, no, I never came across a bad person mm-hmm. just be, because it's certainly because they instruct me. The thing that bugs me the most is why are we talking about anything that would involve like, hey, you're you know you're a better person? The methods speak for themselves. Mm-hmm. They are effective. Now we can get into the minutia of is it this the most effective all the time in every? I don't know. You would know that better than me. Yeah, you're more. But they work. I don't, I, that I'm not interested in debating with anybody, whether it's Twitter or Zoom or mm-hmm. I, I work. You, if you're good at it and you do it right, then you can have a positive impact. And now if I can have a positive impact and feel better about me personally, just the way I, I just the way that, that coaching this way makes me feel I'm good. And so uh, it took me a long time to get to that place. I'm still like, we talked about a little bit before the call, like I'm still chipping away at a lot of doubt and a lot of, uh, a lot of lack of clarity at times. Um, but I do, I love going to work. I love training. I love the practice gym. I love being with the athletes and I love doing it like this or trying to do it like this, if that makes any sense. So yeah, that's a transition from no, okay, a lot of great stuff there. And I think, yeah, your point about, you know, the, the adversarial nature of it. And I, I, I agree. I think part of it comes from, you know, I, you know, I've had to kind of question moments. I've questioned myself with this too, that to kind of get people to listen, you have to be a little kind of a, aggressive about it. And, and to get people to actually change sometimes, I think, um, I think that's where it's coming from rather than a real bad, bad place. I think it's trying to, like, you know, stuff like Stuart does about, cones are evil or something right you know they're not right <laughs> but it's just trying to get people to listen i think you, you kind of push it uh you be you be, you be a bit more you know assertive and, and you know and you be giving all these examples about kids <laughs> like you're right I, I think that's where that's coming from but i i agree with you it's not you know it goes too and, far and for a lot of time and to your point yeah you you and Stu operate in a different space than i do mm-hmm. although the red sox stuff is pretty cool <laughs> You're, you're, that's, that's pretty sweet. You should be pretty proud of that. And they're really lucky to have you, but, um, you guys are, are more, uh, like coach developers, coach Mm -hmm. educators, you're um, among dozens of different hats. And I know Stu coaches, so he's kind of doing the dual thing. But for me, the only thing that I'm beholden to Jeff Fairbrother said this to me once and was like, I don't know, like changed my life. (laughs) He said, Casey, you're not. Because I was asking him, like, hey, right at the very beginning, as I kind of got exposed to some of the ecological stuff, I go, hey, do you know about this stuff? He goes, yeah, you know about it. It's, so there's some cool stuff and maybe some stuff that's not for me and whatever. But I, I'm going, like, well, what should I do? And he, he, I was kind of like, you know, just destabilized. And he goes, hey, you don't owe me anything. And you don't owe Keith Davids anything. You don't owe any theory or any paper or anybody anything outside of the athletes you coach and maybe the person that hired you You probably own like Mm -hmm. forever you own that but really who you owe is your athletes you owe them the best experience possible and yeah that is going to involve winning so doing your job well and developing them well so they can win that's they're going to be happier when they win that's the nature but you that's who you owe and so to that point like i don't I don't tend to engage much in like the debates around it. And it's maybe, it's, I don't know if it's selfish or I'm afraid or whatever. I don't know. But for me, it's not like, I don't look at my charge as like educating people. I look at my charge as a coach is like, you have these 12 athletes and you owe them the best experience possible, which means I need to be at my best. Me at my best, I know is doing it this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't speak to, like I said earlier, if, if, if I'm doing it, but when I do it this way, I'm at my best. That's good enough for me. I don't know if it's, you know, better, the best ever, you know, universally or, or uniformly or whatever, but, um, 
Yeah, I think, man, Jeff Ferber, he's, he was pretty profound. That's yeah, cool. no, I, I, yeah, same. And then, you know, and I, yeah, I don't know, you know, no one knows immediately. <laughs> like, it's not, I'm not, we're not trying to, I, I think, to like promote the theory to kind of, for just in and of itself, it's just because the belief that it's, having this kind of broad approach works well, but yeah, no, I'm the same. you know, I, I, we, I was in one of my rules that we, we were, we were talking about something and they were talking about predictive things and it just was easier to facilitate what yeah. we were talking about and get where I wanted to go. So I didn't like, nope, it's perspective control. <laughs> Here's a diagram, you know, it's, yep. in terms of practicality of it, right. There was no, battle no use fighting a battle there you mm-hmm. know or trying to there's you know it was we were you know it, it was getting where it needed to go so yeah so in terms of actually actually putting it into play was it in it was it when you were at miami that you first kind of started to to get, put some of these things into practice yeah i my my role at miami was um it was like really rare i was i was the associate head coach kind of like uh the first mate if you will, I wasn't the mm-hmm. captain of the ship, but I was like uh, kind of next in line or whatever you'd call it. And typically that title uh, involves a little more pay, a little more recognition, but it's, you know, hey, the code, the head coach is going to tell you, here's what you have to do and you're going to do it like this. And um, I had stumbled into this relationship with this, this boss of mine. His name's Keno Gandara, Jose Gandara. He's from Puerto Rico. Um, he just believed in me and he believed in me across a bunch of different iterations of myself. If that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, a bunch of different thoughts and beliefs and things that I held and he just kept believing me. seven years straight of just never doubting that I was capable. And through that belief, he allowed my role to evolve to a point where the, at the, by the end last couple seasons or whatever he allowed me to write all the practice plans Mm -hmm. with no oversight really like he would he would go hey i I like that we should do that again okay (laughs) or uh, hey i'd like to see us address this phase of the game or this aspect or whatever you go into your little crazy lab and and uh cook something up that'll help us do that and uh but i got i mean we're talking about a top 25 team in the country 20 starting i started there at 25 i left at 32 i mean in my late 20s early 30s i'm getting to write all the practices Mm -hmm. top 25 team in the country there wasn't another assistant uh, that i can think of that was getting that without the oversight and and maybe there you are but i know there's not a lot of it Mm -hmm. i had to do all sorts of stuff recruiting kind of how i felt and i I always had to defend it he wasn't just gonna let you know the inmates run the prison so to speak but um, he, he was incredible. I don't, I don't, I'm not that brave. I'm not like, I love my assistant coaches to death, but I'm going to be involved in rap mm-hmm. And, uh, so yeah, I just, that was, and, and to your point, like it allowed me this, this really unfair opportunity to explore the very beginning. So I probably, uh, started you know, getting familiar with the ecological stuff. At this point, six or seven years ago, um, really digging in. And over as my role evolved and my beliefs evolved, I got this really unfair opportunity to like try stuff without my name being the headline. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we would try stuff. And if it sucked, well, Kenno, what are you doing, man? <laughs> but it, and it wasn't attached to me. So I had this really cool chance to like figure out organically, um, you know, what, what ecological methods meant to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm still doing that, but I got to start my head coaching career with this massive head start, you know, where I did, I wasn't my, my, my role at Miami wasn't compliance. I wasn't just do it the way Keno says to do it. And then now I got to go figure out, I either do it that way or I just, now I'm starting from scratch on my own. I got to start my first head coaching job with a ton of, opportunities to try stuff mm-hmm. and um you want to talk about like an ecological coach development environment that <laughs> yeah. was, I mean, that's exactly what it was mm-hmm. and he would make suggestions he challenged stuff and it was just like you look back it's like man that's kind of what we should be doing with our athletes you know give them an opportunity to try things and challenge them and 
help shape that, you know, environment that they're trying things in. But um, yeah, so it started at Miami. Um, and then really uh, the last year that I was there, because um, he actually was very, you know, rooted in a lot of the same things that many of the high level coaches in our sport where this is information processing stuff. And uh, so by my seventh season, I had really just been kind of a little bit more vocal with him and um, and just in general about my my shifting beliefs towards the value of what I, you know, that that's my, my perceived value of the ecological stuff. And he says, basically, go for it. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Try it. And uh, we had, depending on how you slice it, we had uh, maybe the best program in, in or the best, best uh, season in program history. Mm -hmm. 11th in the RPI, which we'd never been anywhere close to that. And that's a, a rating that basically mm -hmm. it's a kind of a, you know, overall, every team in the country is ranked in this formula. And we finished 11th. We hadn't finished anywhere close to that ever. We won a match in the NCAA tournament. And we had a bunch of award winning players. And, and uh, so, but he told me before that season, just go for it. Don't, I don't want you thinking about my biases. Just go for it. Mm -hmm. You, I love what you talk about and I don't understand it at all, uh, but go for it. And if it sucks, then it's on me and I'll say, we're not doing that anymore, but I, I want to go for it. And we did. And it worked, thankfully. Uh, and that gave me so much confidence heading into my first head coaching opportunity, which was very much needed. <laughs> yes. I've, was there, I, if I remember talking to you, I, I was there kind of, maybe this was for both him and you, like, like a convincing stage where you just took one, practice activity and, and changed it up. Was that yeah, more for and, him than, or for you as well? Just to uh, try. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I think looking back, um, initially it was for him, mm -hmm. but also I think <laughs> yeah, it's really important for me. Too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, so that absolutely. When I first got there, I was this, you know, much skinnier, much more handsome, <laughs> Uh, little kid, basically, a 25 year old kid. And uh, it's not like he looked at this 25 year old kid and goes, Here's the keys to the <laughs> yeah. kingdom. So I got there and it was like, Hey, I'll, here's what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to run it. And then the next year, you know, we had lots of conversations. One of my best friends, I got really lucky. Mm -hmm. Most best friends with their boss, I, I happened to to have that relationship. So I'd be at his house all the time. And we'd be just we'd cutting up volleyball, you know, talking about coaching, teaching, and learning. And, and as I evolved, um, he was really sensitive to making me feel safe. Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. like I, hey, I've been reading this stuff and it's like challenges everything. <laughs> and uh, he go, oh, it wasn't like, well, they, they don't know or this. Stuff. It was like, oh, tell me about it. And he go, I don't get it. And I so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll go back and, and keep chipping away at it. But. Concurrently, we he would also like, hey, I want you. And it started with a particular position, the position I played. I was a setter, and he said, hey, go, go make the setters good. And uh, so I got to do that, and and my my methods evolved, and he was kind of paying attention. He was going, hey, this is a little different. <laughs> so <laughs> here's where maybe that difference, comes from. Mm -hmm. you know, explains it. And he liked it. He just thought, oh, that's cool. You know, he he's like a, a really optimistic curious guy. Like he, he's, he's never the guy who like, he's not a skeptic, if that makes any sense. I don't mean that in a bad way, but mm -hmm. like he gets excited by stuff. He, mm -hmm. he likes, he, he's positive and optimistic about things. And so when you bring him something new, it's not like, oh, I don't like new things. He's like, wow, let's check it out. You know? So um, yeah, it, it kind of evolved. And then maybe year three, year four, he was giving me entire activities for the team. Mm -hmm. I have to be over here with the middles, like you were with the setters. You got everybody else. And I get to try some stuff. And then it was like, hey, I want you to write this six on six drill, you know, activity, whatever you call it. And I want you to be in charge of it mm -hmm. and run, be the one in the gym saying, hey, you know, got the whiteboard. By the end, it was like, hey, here's the practice planning sheet if you need it. Go nuts and write it out. And, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow when practice starts, <laughs> and uh, which was great. Um, so it did. It absolutely grew. But there absolutely was a stretch where uh, there was a lot of organic conversations mm -hmm. I, where where I got lucky was just the person that I'm having these conversations. The person who kind of is in control uh, was so um, 
accommodating and not, not in a bad way. Like the guy mm -hmm. was, let our program be bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More with a volleyball program. But he was so accommodating to my development and my thoughts and my beliefs. And, uh, but he also just did like, when I started, it was like, ah, that that's, not, that's not the cognitive stage of learning, you know? <laughs> Where's the automaticity? Yeah. 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 There, no, there's no, not, yeah. There, there's yeah. nothing autonomous about this. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but he, it wasn't like, well, get out of here with this nonsense. It was like, this doesn't add up to what I, what I know. So let's fill that gap. And you, and you, you put it on me. Your job is to help me fill that gap. I'm not, he's like, I'm not the one out there on Google scholar. You, you, you're the mm -hmm. one who opened the doors box. So, mm -hmm. yeah. but he always was up for it. And I think as he saw the method start to, to have a positive impact, just like anything else, you see like, Hey, look, our performance is increasing when in these areas that we're doing it a little differently. Um, and not that our performance wasn't increasing elsewhere. I just, you know, our, our performances, it's not like we're throwing away practice time here by doing mm -hmm. some of it. Mm -hmm. And then he would ask like, Hey, well, okay. I'm going to do setting like that. How would you receive and serve? And how would you do attacking? How would you, you know, like that sort of thing. And, um, but that was like a question born out of curiosity, not out of skepticism. Mm -hmm. It was like, Hey, well, okay. If you're going to do like that, interesting. How would you do passing? Cause maybe we could do that. And, um, which was, it was great. It, it uh, fortunately, it worked. I, I, I probably had a different conversation if, uh, if it had blown up in our face and we terrible. Yeah. 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 No, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, I think that's a great example. I, I use your example. A lot of, of just let me do one thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so kind of turn to, you know, what advice for people that want to kind of coaches that want to explore this. Um, and kind of, I've already seen just listening to you. There's someone, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Um, don't be afraid to say you don't understand, right? That I think you're talking about I'm being really brave. Good at that. I'm really good at that. Yeah. I'm like an but that you're saying that being brave, talking. that's really brave of you. Like, and I'm not just like to come back to Keith and say, I don't get what you're saying here. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of people don't, they feel like. It's like when you give a presentation and they say, are there any questions? And everybody sits there quietly, right? That's our tendency to not want to admit that we don't get what you're talking about. Um, yeah. But I think you have to, you know, that's kind of how you advance. Um, yeah. And also, you know, I think maybe it's just because you, how you, you started, but the, you know, the, you, you have to understand, you have to kind of build the understanding of the science of it and the, Right to to really be able to use it effectively, would you say that? Like, um, like just you know, not everyone has to do what you did. Like maybe go to the direct sources and talk to yeah. the authors and stuff. But maybe I think you need some level of understanding of the the theory and things, right? Or would you yeah. would you agree with that? Yes, I would absolutely. I think there's um, there's a danger to dipping your toe in the water. Mm -hmm. That makes any sense. Uh -huh. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, uh, I remember I was a very prominent coach in our profession. Um, I think the, the, the ecological stuff is, is starting to make its way through volleyball. It's mm -hmm. actually kind of, fun. there's some people who've been doing it for longer than I have. And, um, they, it's, proved effective across a number of different domains. So it's starting to, to become, I think people, we're in this really dicey stage where people are trying to integrate. And we know from a theoretical perspective, the, the challenges or obstacles that exist for attempted integration. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think uh, what's happened is there, there's a really prominent coach in our sport, a very well regarded, very good person. And they, <coughs> excuse me, they kind of made a comment with, as this maybe five, four or five years ago is, is the words constraints led approach kind of filtered into volleyball. They said, Hey, we tried that once and, uh, didn't work. Uh, we didn't get any better. And I, it wasn't me. It was another person having this conversation with this coach, but the person asked them, well, you know, what'd you do? And this coach explained one activity in one practice that basically what they did is they just didn't instruct. Mm -hmm. They didn't give cues. They didn't, they weren't giving like performance cues. They weren't, you know, they kind of just stood aside. And uh, it was this dismissal. 
And really where it came from is just a lack of understanding and, and of you know what the constraints led approach mm-hmm. uh, is what it advocates for. And so, uh, but also like you can go the other way where people are, are, they go variability. Hey, that's important, right? Nonlinear pedagogy says movement variability and just yeah. variability practice. All that stuff's important. So let's just go nuts. <laughs> let's just make it chaos. And, and that's, that's dangerous. Mm-hmm. Uh, performance and learning someone from a health standpoint, it can be dangerous. So um, I, I, one of the things I've, I've kind of come full circle on um, is I do appreciate uh, the intuition of experienced coaches more and, and hopefully my intuition. I, I, one of the things I do lament occasionally is the fact that I got into the, the academic stuff so early on in my coaching career, really before it started that I, I probably blunted, um, you know, sensitivity to my own intuition. Okay. This just feels odd. I, I kind of just would go like, Oh, the, mm-hmm. the full says, you know? And, um, so I've, I've really come to back around to appreciate intuition and, um, and, but, uh, I think that, that, uh, if you kind of go in between, um, it can get dicey, you know, and then, and then like the self-fulfilling prophecy of like, well, it doesn't work. And yeah. So I'm, I'm ignore it. So, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, do you have to know the implications of stochastic resonance to <laughs> appreciate differential learning? No, mm-hmm. in my opinion, no. But do you need to know some of the principles before we just go, like, it, there's a, a, one of the things, differential learning has become like the thing now in volleyball. It's like, it'll be a flavor of the month for the next six months, and then, mm-hmm. you know, someone else will catch somebody else's eye. And, and uh, one of the things that, that it, people are having a really tough time understanding in our sport is the idea of randomness uh, in differential learning. They want to systemize, they want to make the variability systematic. Okay, we're going to do 10 with this weight ball and 10 with that weight ball, and we're going to progressively increase. Kind of like that study that was done with the baseball pitchers. Mm-hmm. And the weight. I know you've always advocated for, hey, if we would have randomized it, the, the results could have been very different. Um we're, we're misinterpreting because we think that, that it's just like, Oh, try a little bit of everything. Uh, but we don't, we haven't gone quite deep enough to understand, try a little bit of everything randomly mm-hmm. the value of that, because the value comes from the fact that we're constantly changing our interaction with something new, because if I go 10 reps of this and then 10 reps of that, I really only changed one time. Mm-hmm. I made one time shit, you know? And, uh, so I just, I, I would advocate for it, you know, and it's hard, but, but Rob, here's the thing. My dad was a dentist and if I wanted to be a dentist, I couldn't walk down to my local dentist office and go like, Hey, you know, I, my dad was a dentist and I had like a bunch of cavities as a kid and I floss every day and you should hire me. The first thing they're going to do is be like, where's your license? Where's your degree? Mm-hmm. I don't have those things. Like you can't do it. And, and the crazy thing to me is, no offense to my dad or any dentist out there, but if I do this profession right, I'm going to have way more impact on way more people than a dentist will. Mm-hmm. The occasional person out there is like, oh man, my life was changed because I got a pretty smile. But mostly it's going to be our coaches, right? So, and we don't have anything like that. We don't have any licensing or education. And I'm not even necessarily advocating for that to be the case. I think you'd lose a lot of like grassroots coaches and that's not good. Mm. But at least let's set a standard for ourselves, like a professional standard for ourselves where there's some stuff out there on pedagogy It exists and there's some debate. There's a, there's a significant debate that goes on in the academic community about pedagogically what is best. And those debates haven't been fully fleshed out yet. It's probably gonna be a long time before they are. And, but let's be familiar with it. Like, and it doesn't mean you have to write a, a dissertation to be familiar with it, but just familiarize yourself and, and, Get a sense for what one side is advocating for, what the other side is advocating for, uh, some of the concepts that are coming out, how they may re- interact and relate. And um, and I just I can't I can't get past the idea that we should be engaging more with the people that are doing the research and that are do- writing the theories. Mm-hmm. And I because I think there's been a little bit of pushback on occasion where it's like, well, they don't coach. Yeah, oh, yeah I get that. You know, and, and that's where my intuition comes into play. Like they may say something like, Hey, you should do this, that, or the other thing. And I go, uh, yeah. Yeah. because I've been through it enough. I know that this is going to be better, but I, 
we, why do we keep going coaches for science? Like Pete, I, every time somebody comes to me, no, sorry, Rob, but I just sent them to you. <laughs> now, Rob, you should, you should subscribe to his page. You should like listen to his podcast. I, I'm a coach who's trying to flesh this stuff out and make it work. He's, he knows what he's doing. Go to Keith, you know, go to Will Roberts and go to, go to the, mm. you know, go to these people, go to Ed Cohen. Like these people, they've devoted their life to understanding this at like the deepest level you we currently are capable of go to them. And I advocate for more of that personally. Now with the appreciation that like, it's our responsibility to adapt it for our respective contexts. You know, you don't just go full sale, like, Hey, a scientist said to do that. No, but let's, let's understand this material through their voice, their lens. And because they're, they're better equipped to, to explain it to us than, than another coach is. I'm not, I'm not as equipped to you as you are to explain direct perception. I'm just not. And so I could try, right. But also I could say, Hey, just go to Rob. And that's ruining your day because. <laughs> no, that's, I love it. <laughs> no, that, no, I think that that's, that's great advice is kind of make, you know, make it your own and take, but yeah, I, I've also, I've seen a lot lately, the language, you know, shapes the way you think. And, the, uh, it, and so if you get you know, I've seen a group of coaches start using constraints regularly as we discuss things. It sh it shapes how we plan and think about practice um, just by the very nature of kind of talking about things in certain terminologies and things like that. So, yeah. Um, any final words? Uh, uh, I, mostly the, any, I just want to mm. express my gratitude and probably on behalf of, of, uh, Coaches, I think at this point, literally all over the world, uh, just we what you do probably doesn't get appreciated enough. I think it gets it's starting to get acknowledged a lot. I mean, you're working the Red Sox for God's sake, like you're, <laughs> you're you're on the on the top of the mountain. But I just want to make sure that you know how much we all appreciate everything that you do and the, and your manner uh, about it. Because I get frustrated with a lot of people in academia who are looking for a fight. Mm -hmm. you know? looking for a scrap and they lose sight of the material in an effort to just be combative. You don't. And I think, uh, we, I, I don't, we probably don't express our appreciation for that enough. You're, you're really special to our community, whether, whether it's people who agree with you or don't, the way you go about doing this, this podcast, your, the work you do is really special. You should be really proud and we appreciate it more than we'll ever tell you. Oh, thank you, Casey. I appreciate it a lot. And I appreciate you sharing your story. I think it really helps people, I think, to know, you know, the, those insecurity, hear about insecurities and, you know, everybody goes through that. And, and I think it's yeah. important to hear about. So, so thanks for joining me. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at Rob Gray at ASU.edu or follow me on Twitter at ShakeyWeights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out PerceptionAction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including a monthly coaches meetup, please head over to Patreon.com forward slash PerceptionAction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Yeah, gone straight away.